Chapter 10 of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 1. The house was haunted long before evening. Shadows slipped down the walls and waited behind every chair. Did that door move? No, she wouldn't go to the Jolly Seventeen. She hadn't energy enough to caper before them, to smile blandly at Juanita's rudeness. Not today. But she did want a party. Now. If someone would come in this afternoon, someone who liked her. Vida, or Mrs. Sam Clark, or old Mrs. Champ Perry, or gentle Mrs. Dr. Westlake, or Guy Pollock. She'd telephone. No, that wouldn't be it. They must come of themselves. Perhaps they would. Why not? She'd have a tea ready anyway. If they came, splendid. If not, what did she care? She wasn't going to yield to the village and let down. She was going to keep up a belief in the right of tea, to which she had always looked forward as the symbol of a leisurely fine existence. And it would be just as much fun, even if it was so babyish, to have tea by herself and pretend that she was entertaining clever men. It would. She turned the shining thought into action. She bustled to the kitchen, stoked the wood range, sang Schumann while she boiled the kettle, warmed up raisin cookies on a newspaper spread on the rack in the oven. She scampered upstairs to bring down her filmiest tea cloth. She arranged a silver tray. She proudly carried it into the living room and set it on the long cherry wood table, pushing aside a hoop of embroidery, a volume of Conrad from the library copies of the Saturday Evening Post, the Literary Digest, and Kennicott's National Geographic magazine. She moved the tray back and forth and regarded the effect. She shook her head. She busily unfolded the sewing table, set it in the bay window, patted the tea cloth to smoothness, moved the tray. Sometime I'll have a mahogany tea table, she said happily. She brought in two cups, two plates for herself a straight chair, but for the guest the big wing-chair, which she pantingly tugged to the table. She had finished all the preparation she could think of. She sat and waited. She listened for the doorbell, the telephone. Her eagerness was stilled. Her hands drooped. Surely Vida Sherwin would hear the summons. She glanced through the bay window. Snow was sifting over the ridge of the Howland House like sprays of water from a hose. The wide yards across the street were gray with moving eddies. The black trees shivered. The roadway was gashed with ruts of ice. She looked at the extra cup and plate. She looked at the wing-chair. It was so empty. The tea was cold in the pot. With wearily dipping fingertip she tested it. Yes, quite cold. She couldn't wait any longer. The cup across from her was icily clean glisteningly empty. Simply absurd to wait. She poured her own cup of tea. She sat and stared at it. What was it she was going to do now? Oh, yes, how idiotic! Take a lump of sugar. She didn't want the beastly tea. She was springing up. She was on the couch, sobbing. 2. She was thinking more sharply than she had for weeks. She reverted to her resolution to change the town, awaken it, prod it, reform it. What if they were wolves instead of lambs? They eat her all the sooner if she was meek to them. Fight or be eaten. It was easier to change the town completely than to conciliate it. She could not take their point of view. It was a negative thing, an intellectual squalor, a swamp of prejudices and fears. She would have to make them take hers. She was not a Vincent de Paul, to govern and mold a people. What of that? The tiniest change in their distrust of beauty would be the beginning of the end, a seed to sprout and some day with thickening roots to crack their wall of mediocrity. If she could not, as she desired, do a great thing nobly and with laughter, yet she need not be content with village nothingness. She would plant one seed in the blank wall. Was she just? Was it merely a blank wall, this town which to three thousand and more people was the center of the universe? 
hadn't she, returning from Lac-Wamur, felt the heartiness of their greetings? No. The ten thousand gopher prairies had no monopoly of greetings and friendly hands. Sam Clark was no more loyal than girl librarian she knew in St. Paul, the people she had met in Chicago. And those others had so much that Gopher Prairie complacently lacked, the world of gaiety and adventure, of music and the integrity of bronze, of remembered mists from tropic isles and Paris nights and the walls of Baghdad, of industrial justice and a god who spake not in doggerel hymns. One seed! Which seed it was did not matter. All knowledge and freedom were one. But she had delayed so long in finding that seed. Could she do something with this Thanatopsis club? Or should she make her house so charming that it would be an influence? She'd make Kennicott like poetry. That was it, for a beginning. She conceived so clear a picture of their bending over large fair pages by the fire in a non-existent fireplace, that the spectral presences slipped away. Doors no longer moved, curtains were not creeping shadows but lovely dark masses in the dusk, and when B came home Kara was singing at the piano which she had not touched for many days. Their supper was the feast of two girls. Carol was in the dining-room, in a frock of black satin edged with gold, and B, in blue gingham and an apron, dined in the kitchen but the door was open between, and Carol was inquiring, "'Did you see any ducks in Doll's window?' and B chanting, "'No, ma'am. Say, we have a swell time this afternoon. Tina, she have coffee and knackebrot, and her feller was there, and we used laughed and laughed, and her feller say he was president, and he going to make me queen of Finland, and I stick a feather in my hair and say, I been going to go to var. Oh, we were so foolish, and we laughed so!" When Carol sat at the piano again she did not think of her husband, but of the book-drugged hermit Guy Pollock. She wished that Pollock would come calling. If a girl really kissed him, he'd creep out of his den and be human. If Will were as literate as Guy, or Guy as executive as Will, I think I could endure even go for prairie. It's so hard to mother Will. I could be maternal with Guy. Is that what I want? Something to mother? A man or baby or a town? I will have a baby. Some day. But to have him isolated here all his receptive years. And so to bed. Have I found my real level in bee and kitchen gossip? Oh, I do miss you, Will. But it will be pleasant to turn over in bed as often as I want to, without worrying about waking you up. Am I really this settled thing called a married woman? I feel so unmarried tonight, so free. To think that there was once a Mrs. Kennicott who let herself worry over a town called Gopher Prairie when there was a whole world outside it. Of course, Will is going to like poetry. 3. A black February day, clouds hewn of ponderous timber weighing down on the earth an irresolute dropping of snow-specks upon the trampled wastes. Gloom, but no veiling of angularity. The lines of roofs and sidewalks sharp and inescapable. The second day of Kennicott's absence. She fled from the creepy house for a walk. It was thirty below zero, too cold to exhilarate her. In the spaces between houses the wind caught her. It stung, it gnawed at nose and ears and aching cheeks and she hastened from shelter to shelter, catching her breath in the lee of a barn, grateful for the protection of a billboard covered with ragged posters showing layer under layer of paste-smeared green and streaky red. The grove of oaks at the end of the street suggested Indians, hunting, snowshoes, and she struggled past the earth-banked cottages to the open country, to a farm and a low hill corrugated with hard snow. In her loose nutria coat, sealed toque, virginal cheeks unmarked by lines of village jealousies, she was as out of place on this dreary hillside as a scarlet tanager on an ice floe. She looked down on Gopher Prairie. The snow, stretching without break from streets to devouring prairie beyond, wiped out the town's pretense of being a shelter. The houses were black specks on a white sheet. 
her heart shivered with that still loneliness as her body shivered with the wind. She ran back into the huddle of streets, all the while protesting that she wanted a city's yellow glare of shop windows and restaurants, or the primitive forest with hooded furs and a rifle, or a barnyard warm and steamy, noisy with hens and cattle, certainly not these dun houses, these yards choked with winter ash-piles, these roads of dirty snow and clotted frozen mud. The zest of winter was gone. Three months more till May, the cold might drag on, with the snow ever filthier, the weakened body less resistant. She wondered why the good citizens insisted on adding the chill of prejudice, why they did not make the houses of their spirits more warm and frivolous, like the wise chatterers of Stockholm and Moscow. She circled the outskirts of the town and viewed the slum of Swede Hollow. Wherever as many as three houses are gathered, there will be a slum of at least one house. In Gopher Prairie, the Sam Clarks boasted, "'You don't get any of this poverty that you find in cities. Always plenty of work. No need of charity. Man got to be blame shiftless if he don't get ahead.' But now that the summer mask of leaves and grass was gone, Carol discovered misery and dead hope. In a shack of thin boards covered with tar-paper she saw the washerwoman, Mrs. Steinhoff, working in gray steam. Outside her six-year-old boy chopped wood. He had a torn jacket, muffler of a blue like skimmed milk. His hands were covered with red mittens through which protruded his chapped raw knuckles. He halted to blow on them, to cry disinterestedly. A family of recently arrived Finns were camped in an abandoned stable. A man of eighty was picking up lumps of coal along the railroad. She did not know what to do about it. She felt that these independent citizens, who had been taught that they belonged to a democracy, would resent her trying to play Lady Bountiful. She lost her loneliness in the activity of the village industries, the railroad yards with a freight train switching, the wheat elevator, oil tanks, a slaughterhouse with blood marks on the snow the creamery with the sleds of farmers and piles of milk cans, an unexplained stone hut labeled Danger, powder stored here, the jolly tombstone yard, where a utilitarian sculptor in a red calfskin overcoat whistled as he hammered the shiniest of granite headstones, Jackson Elder's small planing mill, with the smell of fresh pine shavings and the burr of circular saws, most important, the Gopher Prairie Flour and Milling Company, Lyman Cass, president. Its windows were blanketed with flower dust, but it was the most stirring spot in town. Workmen were wheeling barrels of flour into a boxcar. A farmer sitting on sacks of wheat in a bobsled argued with the wheat buyer. Machinery within the mill boomed and whined, water gurgled in the ice-freed mill race. The clatter was a relief to Carol after months of smug houses. She wished that she could work in the mill that she did not belong to the caste of professional man's wife. She started for home, through the small slum. Before a tar-paper shack, at a gateless gate, a man in rough brown dogskin coat and black plush cap with lappets was watching her. His square face was confident, his foxy mustache was picaresque. He stood erect, his hands in his side pockets, his pipe puffing slowly. He was forty-five or six, perhaps. How do, Mrs. Kennicott? he drawled. She recalled him, the town handyman, who had repaired their furnace at the beginning of winter. Oh, how do you do? she fluttered. My name's Bjornstam. The Red Swede, they call me, remember? Always thought I'd kind of like to say howdy to you again. Ye yes. I've been exploring the outskirts of town. Yup, fine mess. No sewage, no street cleaning, and the Lutheran minister and the priest represent the arts and sciences. Well, thunder, we submerged tenth down here in Sweet Hollow, or no worse off than you folks. Thank God we don't have to go and purr at Juanity Haydock at the jolly old seventeen. The Carol, who regarded herself as completely adaptable, was uncomfortable at being chosen as a comrade by a pipe reeking odd job man. Probably he was one of her husband's patients. But she must keep her dignity. Yes, even the Jolly Seventeen isn't always so exciting. 
It's very cold again today, isn't it? Well, Bjornstam was not respectfully valedictory. He showed no signs of pulling a forelock. His eyes moved as though they had a life of their own. With a sub-grin he went on. Maybe I hadn't ought to talk about Mrs. Haydock and her solemn Charlie Seventeen in that fresh way. I suppose I'd be tickled to death if I was invited to sit in with that gang. I'm what they call a pariah, I guess. I'm the town bad man, Mrs. Kennicott. Town atheist. And I suppose I must be an anarchist, too. Everybody who doesn't love the bankers and the grand old Republican Party is an anarchist." Carol had unconsciously slipped from her attitude of departure into an attitude of listening, her face full toward him, her muff lowered. She fumbled. "'Yes, I suppose so.' Her own grudges came in a flood. "'I don't see why you shouldn't criticize the Jolly Seventeen if you want to. They aren't sacred.' "'Oh, yes, they are. The dollar sign has chased the crucifix clean off the map. But then I've got no kick. I do what I please, and I suppose I ought to let them do the same." "'What do you mean by saying you're a pariah?' "'I'm poor, and yet I don't decently envy the rich. I'm an old batch. I make enough money for a steak, and then I sit around by myself, and shake hands with myself, and have a smoke and read history, and I don't contribute to the wealth of Brother Elder or Daddy Cass." "'You... I fancy you read a good deal.' "'Yep. In a hit-or-miss way. I'll tell you, I'm a lone wolf. I trade horses, and saw wood, and work in lumber camps. I'm a first-rate swamper. Always wished I could go to college, though I suppose I'd find it pretty slow, and they'd probably kick me out. You really are a curious person, Mr. Bjornstam, Miles Bjornstam, half Yank and half Swede. Usually known as that damn lazy big mouth calamity howler that ain't satisfied with the way we run things. No, I ain't curious. Whatever you mean by that, I'm just a bookworm. Probably too much reading for the amount of digestion I've got. Probably half baked. I'm going to get in half baked first to beat you to it because it's dead sure to be handed to a radical that wears jeans." They grinned together. She demanded, "'You say that the Jolly Seventeen is stupid. What makes you think so?' "'Oh, trust us borers into the Foundation to know about your leisure class. Fact, Mrs. Kennicott, I'll say that far as I can make out, the only people in this man's town that do have any brains. I don't mean ledger-keeping brains or duck-hunting brains or baby-spanking brains, but real, imaginative brains, are you and me and Guy Pollock and the foreman at the flour mill. He's a socialist, the foreman. Don't tell Lime Cass that. Lime would fire a socialist quicker than he would a horse-thief. Indeed, no, I shan't tell him. This foreman and I have some great set-tos. He's a regular old Lime party member. Too dogmatic expects to reform everything from deforestation to nosebleed by saying phrases like surplus value, like reading the prayer book. But same time, he's a Plato J. Aristotle compared with people like Esri Stowbody, or Professor Mott, or Julius Flickerball. It's interesting to hear about him. He dug his toe into a drift, like a schoolboy. Rats, you mean I talk too much. Well, I do when I get hold of somebody like you. You probably want to run along and keep your nose from freezing." "'Yes, I must go, I suppose. But tell me, why did you leave Miss Sherwin, of the high school, out of your list of the town intelligentsia?' "'I guess maybe she does belong in it. From all I can hear, she's in everything and behind everything that looks like a reform, lot more than most folks realize. She lets Mrs. Reverend Warren, the president of this here Thanatopsis Club, think she's running the works, but Miss Sherman is the secret boss and nags all the easy-going dames into doing something. But way I figure it out. You see, I'm not interested in these dinky reforms. Miss Sherwin's trying to repair the holes in this barnacle-covered ship of a town by keeping busy bailing out the water, and Pollock tries to repair it by reading poetry to the crew. Me. I want to yank it up on the ways, and fire the poor bum of a shoemaker that built it so it sails crooked, 
and have it rebuilt right, from the keel up." "'Yes, that—that would be better. But I must run home. My poor nose is nearly frozen. Say, you better come in and get warm, and see what an old batch's shack is like." She looked doubtfully at him, at the low shanty, the yard that was littered with cordwood, moldy planks, a hoopless washtub. She was disquieted, but Bjornstam did not give her the opportunity to be delicate. He flung out his hand in a welcoming gesture which assumed that she was her own counselor, that she was not a respectable married woman, but fully a human being. With a shaky, well, just a moment to warm my nose, she glanced down the street to make sure that she was not spied on and bolted toward the shanty. She remained for one hour, and never had she known a more considerate host than the Red Swede. He had but one room, bare pine floor, small workbench, wall bunk with amazingly neat bed, frying pan and ash stippled coffee pot on the shelf behind the pot bellied cannonball stove, backwoods chairs, one constructed from half a barrel, one from a tilted plank, and a row of books incredibly assorted. Byron and Tennyson and Stevenson, a manual of gas engines, a book by Thorstein Veblen, and a spotty treatise on the care feeding diseases and breeding of poultry and cattle. There was but one picture, a magazine color plate of a steep roofed village in the Hartz Mountains, which suggested kobolds and maidens with golden hair. Bjornstam did not fuss over her. He suggested, might throw open your coat and put your feet up on the box in front of the stove." He tossed his dogskin coat into the bunk, lowered himself into the barrel chair, and droned on. "'Yeah, I'm probably a yahoo, but by gum I do keep my independence by doing odd jobs, and that's more than these polite cusses like the clerks in the banks do. When I'm rude to some slob, it may be partly because I don't know better and God knows I'm not no authority on trick forks and what pants you wear with the Prince Albert, but mostly it's because I mean something. I'm about the only man in Johnson County that remembers the joker in the Declaration of Independence about Americans being supposed to have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I meet old Ezra Stowbody on the street. He looks at me like he wants me to remember he's a high mucky-muck and worth two hundred thousand dollars, and he says, A uh, Bjornquist. Bjornstam's my name, Ezra, I says. He knows my name already. Well, whatever your name is, he says, I understand you have a gasoline saw. I want you to come around and saw up four cords of maple for me, he says. So, you like my looks, eh? I says, kind of innocent. What difference does that make? Want you to saw that wood before Saturday, he says, real sharp. Common workmen going and getting fresh with a fifth of a million dollars all walking around in a hand-me-down fur coat. "'Here's a difference it makes,' I says, just to devil him. "'How do you know I like your looks?' Maybe he didn't look sore. "'Nope,' I says, thinking it all over. "'I don't like your application for a loan. Take it to another bank. Only there ain't any,' I says, and I walks off on him. Sure. Probably I was surly and foolish, but I figured there had to be one man in town independent enough to sass the banker. He hitched out of his chair, made coffee, gave Carol a cup, and talked on, half defiant and half apologetic, half wistful for friendliness and half amused by her surprise at the discovery that there was a proletarian philosophy. At the door she hinted, Mr. Bjornstam, if you were I, would you worry when people thought you were affected? Huh? Kick em in the face! Say, if I were a seagull, and all over silver, think I'd care what a pack of dirty seals thought about my flying? It was not the wind at her back, it was the thrust of Bjornstam's scorn which carried her through town. She faced Juanita Haydock, cocked her head at Maud Dyer's brief nod, and came home to be radiant. She telephoned Vida Sherwin to run over this evening. She lustily played Tchaikovsky, the virile chords and echo of the red, laughing philosopher of the tar-paper shack. When she hinted to Vida, "'Isn't there a man here who amuses himself by being irreverent to the village gods? Bjornstam, some such a name?' The reform leader said, 
Bjornstam, oh yes, fixes things. He's awfully impertinent. 4. Kennicott had returned at midnight. At breakfast he said four several times that he had missed her every moment. On her way to market Sam Clark hailed her. "'The top of the morning to yous. Going to stop and pass the time of day, Mitt Samuel? Warmer, eh? What did the doc's thermometer say it was? Say, you folks better come round and visit with us one of these evenings. Don't be so doggone proud, staying by yourselves." Champ Perry, the pioneer, wheat buyer at the elevator, stopped her in the post office, held her hand in his withered paws, peered at her with faded eyes, and chuckled, "'You are so fresh and blooming, my dear. Mother was saying t'other other day that a sight of you was better than a dose of medicine.' In the Bonton store she found Guy Pollock tentatively buying a modest gray scarf. "'We haven't seen you for so long,' she said. "'Wouldn't you like to come in and play cribbage some evening?' As though he meant it, Pollock begged, "'May I, really?' While she was purchasing two yards of Malines, the vocal Ramy Weatherspoon tiptoed up to her, his long sallow face bobbing, and he besought, "'You've just got to come back to my department and see a pair of patent leather slippers I set aside for you.' In a matter of more than sacerdotal reverence, he unlaced her boots, tucked her skirt about her ankles, slid on the slippers. She took them. "'You're a good salesman,' she said. "'I'm not a salesman at all. I just like elegant things. All this is so inartistic.' He indicated with a forlornly waving hand the shelves of shoe-boxes, the seat of thin wood perforated in rosettes, the display of shoe-trees and tin-boxes of blacking, the lithograph of a smirking young woman with cherry cheeks who proclaimed in the exalted poetry of advertising, "'My tootsies never get hep to what pedal perfection was till I got a pair of clever classy Cleopatra shoes.' "'But sometimes,' Ramy sighed, "'there is a pair of dainty little shoes like these, and I set them aside for someone who will appreciate. When I saw these I said right away, wouldn't it be nice if they fitted Mrs. Kennicott? and I meant to speak to you first chance I had. I haven't forgotten our jolly talks at Mrs. Gary's." That evening Guy Pollock came in, and though Kennicott instantly impressed him into a cribbage game, Carol was happy again. 5. She did not, in recovering something of her buoyancy, forget her determination to begin the liberalizing of Gopher Prairie by the easy and agreeable propaganda of teaching Kennicott to enjoy reading poetry in the lamplight. The campaign was delayed. Twice he suggested that they call on neighbors. Once he was in the country. The fourth evening he yawned pleasantly, stretched, and inquired, "'Well, what'll we do tonight? Shall we go to the movies?' "'I know exactly what we're going to do. Now don't ask questions come and sit down by the table. There, are you comfy? Lean back and forget you're a practical man and listen to me." It may be that she had been influenced by the managerial Vida Sherwin. Certainly she sounded as though she was selling culture. But she dropped it when she sat on the couch, her chin in her hands, a volume of Yeats on her knees, and read aloud. Instantly she was released from the homely comfort of a prairie town. She was in the world of lonely things, the flutter of twilight linnets, the aching call of gulls along a shore to which the netted foam crept out of darkness, the island of Ingus and the elder gods and the eternal glories that never were, tall kings and women girdled with crusted gold, the woeful incessant chanting, and the— cha cha coughed Dr. Kennicott. She stopped. She remembered that he was the sort of person who chewed tobacco. She glared while he uneasily petitioned. "'That's great stuff. Studied in college? I like poetry fine. James Whitcomb Riley and some of Longfellow. This Hiawatha. Gosh, I wish I could appreciate that highbrow art stuff. But I guess I'm too old a dog to learn new tricks.' With pity for his bewilderment and a certain desire to giggle, she consoled him. "'Then let's try some Tennyson.' You've read him?" "'Tennyson? You bet. Read him in school. There's that—' 
and let there be no, what is it, of farewell, when I put out to sea, but let the, well, I don't remember all of it, but, oh, sure, and there's that, I met a little country boy who, I don't remember exactly how it goes, but the chorus ends up, we are seven. Yes, well, shall we try the idols of the king? They're so full of color. Go to it, shoot. But he hastened to shelter himself behind a cigar. She was not transported to Camelot. She read with an eye cocked on him, and when she saw how much he was suffering she ran to him, kissed his forehead, cried, You poor forced tubros that wants to be a decent turnip. Look here now, that ain't... Anyway, I shan't torture you any longer." She could not quite give up. She read Kipling, with a great deal of emphasis. "'There's a regiment a-coming down the Grand Trunk Road.' He tapped his foot to the rhythm. He looked normal and reassured. But when he complimented her, "'That was fine. I don't know but you can elocute just as good as Ella Stowbody. She banged the book and suggested that they were not too late for the nine o'clock show at the movies. That was her last effort to harvest the April wind, to teach divine unhappiness by a correspondence course, to buy the lilies of Avalon and the sunsets of cocaine in tin cans at old Jensen's grocery. But the fact is that at the motion pictures she discovered herself laughing as heartily as Kennicott at the humor of an actor who stuffed spaghetti down a woman's evening frock. For a second she loathed her laughter, mourned for the day when on her hill by the Mississippi she had walked the battlements with queens. But the celebrated cinema jester's conceit of dropping toads into a soup-plate flung her into unwilling tittering, and the afterglow faded, the dead queens fled through darkness. 6. She went to the Jolly Seventeen's afternoon bridge. She had learned the elements of the game from the Sam Clarks. She played quietly and reasonably badly. She had no opinions on anything more polemic than woolen union suits, a topic on which Mrs. Howland discoursed for five minutes. She smiled frequently and was the complete canary-bird in her manner of thanking the hostess, Mrs. Dave Dyer. Her only anxious period was during the conference on husbands. The young matrons discussed the intimacies of domesticity with a frankness and a minuteness which dismayed Carol. Juanita Haydock communicated Harry's method of shaving, and his interest in deer-shooting. Mrs. Gogerling reported fully, and with some irritation, her husband's inappreciation of liver and bacon. Maud Dyer chronicled Dave's digestive disorders quoted a recent bedtime controversy with him in regard to Christian science, socks and the sewing of buttons upon vests, announced that she simply wasn't going to stand his always pawing girls when he went and got crazy jealous of a man just danced with her, and rather more than sketched Dave's varieties of kisses. So meekly did Carol give attention, so obviously was she at last desirous of being one of them, that they looked on her fondly and encouraged her to give such details of her honeymoon as might be of interest. She was embarrassed rather than resentful. She deliberately misunderstood. She talked of Kennicott's overshoes and medical ideals till they were thoroughly bored. They regarded her as agreeable but green. Till the end she labored to satisfy the Inquisition. She bubbled at Juanita, the president of the club, that she wanted to entertain them. Only, she said, I don't know that I can give you any refreshments as nice as Mrs. Dyer's salad, or that simply delicious angel's food we had at your house, dear. Fine. We need a hostess for the 17th of March. Wouldn't it be awfully original if you made it a St. Patrick's Day bridge? I'll be tickled to death to help you with it. I'm glad you've learned to play bridge. At first I didn't hardly know if you were going to like Gopher Prairie. Isn't it dandy that you've settled down to being homey with us? Maybe we aren't as highbrow as the cities, but we do have the daisiest times, and—oh, we go swimming in summer, and dances, and—oh, lots of good times. If folks will just take us as we are, I think we're a pretty good bunch." I'm sure of it. Thank you so much for the idea of having a St. Patrick's Day bridge. Oh, that's nothing. 
I always think the Jolly Seventeen are so good at original ideas. If you knew these other towns, Wakaman and Jeralman and all, you'd find out and realize that G.P. is the liveliest, smartest town in the state. Did you know that Percy Bresnahan, the famous auto manufacturer, came from here, and— Yes, I think that a St. Patrick's Day party would be awfully cunning and original, and yet not too queer or freaky or anything. End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 1. She had often been invited to the weekly meetings of the Thanatopsis, the Women's Study Club, but she had put it off. The Thanatopsis was, Vida Sherwin promised, such a cozy group, and yet it puts you in touch with all the intellectual thoughts that are going on everywhere. Early in March, Mrs. Westlake, wife of the veteran physician, marched into Carol's living room like an amiable old pussy and suggested, "'My dear, you really must come to the Thanatopsis this afternoon. Mrs. Dawson is going to be leader, and the poor soul is frightened to death. She wanted me to get you to come. She says she's sure you will brighten up the meeting with your knowledge of books and writings. English poetry is our topic today. So shoo, put on your coat.' English poetry? Really? I'd love to go. I didn't realize you were reading poetry. Oh, we're not so slow." Mrs. Luke Dawson, wife of the richest man in town, gaped at them piteously when they appeared. Her expensive frock of beaver-colored satin with rows, plasters, and pendants of solemn brown beads was intended for a woman twice her size. She stood wringing her hands in front of nineteen folding chairs, in her front parlor with its faded photograph of Minnehaha Falls in 1890, its colored enlargement of Mr. Dawson, its bulbous lamp painted with sepia cows and mountains and standing on a mortuary marble column. She creaked, "'Oh, Mrs. Kennicott, I'm in such a fix. I'm supposed to lead the discussion, and I wondered would you come and help?' "'What poet do you take up today?' demanded Carol, in her library tone of, what book do you wish to take out? Why, the English ones. Not all of them. Why, yes. We're learning all of European literature this year. The club gets such a nice magazine, Culture Hints, and we follow its programs. Last year our subject was men and women of the Bible, and next year we'll probably take up furnishings and china. My, it does make a body hustle to keep up with all these new culture subjects, but it is improving. So, will you help us with the discussion today?" On her way over, Carol had decided to use the Thanatopsis as the tool with which to liberalize the town. She had immediately conceived enormous enthusiasm. She had chanted, "'These are the real people. When the housewives who bear the burdens are interested in poetry, it means something. I'll work with them, for them, anything. Her enthusiasm had become watery even before thirteen women resolutely removed their overshoes, sat down meatily, ate peppermints, dusted their fingers, folded their hands, composed their lower thoughts, and invited the naked muse of poetry to deliver her most improving message. They had greeted Carol affectionately, and she tried to be a daughter to them. She felt insecure. Her chair was out in the open, exposed to their gaze and it was a hard-slatted, quivery, slippery church parlor chair, likely to collapse publicly and without warning. It was impossible to sit on it without folding the hands and listening piously. She wanted to kick the chair and run. It would make a magnificent clatter. She saw that Vida Sherwin was watching her. She pinched her wrist, as though she were a noisy child in church, and when she was decent and cramped again, she listened. Mrs. Dawson opened the meeting by sighing. "'I'm sure I'm glad to see you all here today, and I understand that the ladies have prepared a number of very interesting papers. This is such an interesting subject, the poets. They have been an inspiration for higher thought. In fact, 
wasn't it Reverend Benlick who said that some of the poets have been as much an inspiration as a good many of the ministers, and so we shall be glad to hear." The poor lady smiled neuralgically, panted with fright, scrabbled about the small oak table to find her eyeglasses, and continued. We will first have the pleasure of hearing Mrs. Jensen on the subject Shakespeare and Milton. Mrs. Old Jensen said that Shakespeare was born in 1564 and died in 1616. He lived in London, England, and in Stratford-on-Avon, which many American tourists love to visit, a lovely town with many curios and old houses well worth examination. Many people believe that Shakespeare was the greatest playwright who ever lived, also a fine poet. Not much was known about his life, but, after all, that did not really make so much difference, because they loved to read his numerous plays, several of the best known of which she would now criticize. Perhaps the best known of his plays was The Merchant of Venice, having a beautiful love story and a fine appreciation of a woman's brains, which a woman's club, even those who did not care to commit themselves on the question of suffrage, ought to appreciate. Laughter. Mrs. Jensen was sure that she, for one, would love to be like Portia. The play was about a Jew named Shylock, and he didn't want his daughter to marry a Venice gentleman named Antonio. Mrs. Leonard Warren, a slender, gray, nervous woman, president of the Thanatopsis and wife of the Congregational Pastor, reported the birth and death dates of Byron Scott Moore Burns, and wound up, Burns was quite a poor boy and he did not enjoy the advantages we enjoy today, except for the advantages of the fine old Scotch Kirk, where he heard the word of God preached more fearlessly than even in the finest big brick churches in the big and so-called advanced cities of today. But he did not have our educational advantages, and Latin and the other treasures of the mind so richly strewn before the, alas, too oft times inattentive feet of our youth, who do not always sufficiently appreciate the privileges freely granted to every American boy, rich or poor. Burns had to work hard and was sometimes led by evil companionship into low habits. But it is morally instructive to know that he was a good student and educated himself, in striking contrast to the loose ways and so-called aristocratic society life of Lord Byron, on which I have just spoken. And certainly, though the lords and earls of his day may have looked down upon Burns as a humble person, many of us have greatly enjoyed his pieces about the mouse and other rustic subjects, with their message of humble beauty. I am so sorry I have not got the time to quote some of them." Mrs. George Edwin Mott gave ten minutes to Tennyson and Browning. Mrs. Nat Hicks, a wry-faced, curiously sweet woman, so awed by her betters that Carol wanted to kiss her, completed the day's grim task by a paper on other poets. The other poets worthy of consideration were Coleridge, Wordsworth, Shelley, Gray, Mrs. Hemans, and Kipling. Miss Ella Stowbody obliged with a recital of The Recessional, and extracts from La La Rook. By request she gave An Old Sweetheart of Mine as encore. Gopher Prairie had finished the poets. It was ready for the next week's labor, English fiction and essays. Mrs. Dawson besought, Now we will have a discussion of the papers, and I am sure we shall all enjoy hearing from one who we hope to have as a new member, Mrs. Kennicott, who, with her splendid literary training and all, should be able to give us many pointers and many helpful pointers. Carol had warned herself not to be so beastly supercilious. She had insisted that in the belated quest of these work-stained women was an aspiration which ought to stir her tears. But they're so self-satisfied. They think they're doing Burns a favor. They don't believe they have a belated quest. They're sure that they have culture salted and hung up. It was out of this stupor of doubt that Mrs. Dawson's summons roused her. She was in a panic. How could she speak without hurting them? Mrs. Champ Perry leaned over to stroke her hand and whisper, "'You look tired, dearie. Don't you talk unless you want to.' Affection flooded Carol. She was on her feet, searching for words and courtesies. "'The only thing in the way of suggestion. 
I know you are following a definite program, but I do wish that, now you've had such a splendid introduction, instead of going on with some other subject next year, you could return and take up the poets more in detail. Especially actual quotations, even though their lives are so interesting and, as Mrs. Warren said, so morally instructive. And perhaps there are several poets not mentioned today whom it might be worth while considering. Keats, for instance, and Matthew Arnold, and Rossetti, and Swinburne. Swinburne would be such a, well, that is, such a contrast to life as we all enjoy it in our beautiful Middle West." She saw that Mrs. Leonard Warren was not with her. She captured her by innocently continuing, "'Unless, perhaps, Swinburne tends to be, uh, more outspoken than you, than we really like. What do you think, Mrs. Warren?' The pastor's wife decided. "'Why, you've caught my very thoughts, Mrs. Kennicott. Of course, I have never read Swinburne, but years ago, when he was in vogue, I remember Mr. Warren saying that Swinburne, or was it Oscar Wilde, but anyway, he said that though many so-called intellectual people posed and pretended to find beauty in Swinburne, there can never be genuine beauty without the message from the heart. But at the same time I do think you have an excellent idea, and though we have talked about furnishings and China as the probable subject for next year, I believe that it would be nice if the program committee would try to work in another day entirely devoted to English poetry. In fact, Madam Chairman, I so move you." When Mrs. Dawson's coffee and Angel's food had helped them to recover from the depression caused by thoughts of Shakespeare's death, they all told Carol that it was a pleasure to have her with them. The membership committee retired to the sitting-room for three minutes and elected her a member. And she stopped being patronizing. She wanted to be one of them. They were so loyal and kind. It was they who would carry out her aspiration. Her campaign against village sloth was actually begun. On what specific reform should she first loose her army? During the gossip after the meeting, Mrs. George Edwin Mott remarked that the city hall seemed inadequate for the splendid modern Gopher Prairie. Mrs. Nat Hicks timidly wished that the young people could have free dances there. The lodge dances were so exclusive. The city hall! That was it! Carol hurried home. She had not realized that Gopher Prairie was a city. From Kennicott she discovered that it was legally organized with a mayor and city council and wards. She was delighted by the simplicity of voting oneself a metropolis. Why not? She was a proud and patriotic citizen all evening. 2. She examined the city hall next morning. She had remembered it only as a bleak inconspicuousness. She found it a liver-colored frame coop half a block from Main Street. The front was an unrelieved wall of clapboards and dirty windows. It had an unobstructed view of a vacant lot and Nat Hicks's tailor shop. It was larger than the carpenter shop beside it, but not so well built. No one was about. She walked into the corridor. On one side was the municipal court, like a country school. On the other, the room of the volunteer fire company, with a Ford hose cart and the ornamental helmets used in parades. At the end of the hall, a filthy two cell jail now empty but smelling of ammonia and ancient sweat. The whole second story was a large unfinished room, littered with piles of folding chairs, a lime-crusted mortar mixing box, and the skeletons of Fourth of July floats covered with decomposing plaster shields and faded red, white, and blue bunting. At the end was an abortive stage. The room was large enough for the community dances which Mrs. Nat Hicks advocated but Carol was after something bigger than dances. In the afternoon she scampered to the public library. The library was open three afternoons and four evenings a week. It was housed in an old dwelling, sufficient but unattractive. Carol caught herself picturing pleasanter reading-rooms, chairs for children, an art collection, a librarian young enough to experiment. She berated herself, "'Stop this fever of reforming everything!' I will be satisfied with the library. The city hall is enough for a beginning, and it's really an excellent library. It's—it isn't so bad, 
Is it possible that I am to find dishonesties and stupidity in every human activity I encounter? In schools and business and government and everything? Is there never any contentment, never any rest?" She shook her head as though she were shaking off water, and hastened into the library, a young, light, amiable presence, modest in unbuttoned fur coat, blue suit, fresh organdy collar and tan boots roughened from scuffling snow. Miss Villet stared at her, and Carol purred, "'I was so sorry not to see you at the Thanatopsis yesterday. Vida said you might come.' "'Oh! You went to the Thanatopsis. Did you enjoy it?' "'So much. Such good papers on the poets,' Carol lied resolutely. "'But I did think they should have had you give one of the papers on poetry.' "'Well, of course, I'm not one of the bunch who seem to have the time to take and run the club, and if they prefer to have papers on literature by other ladies who have no literary training, after all, why should I complain? What am I but a city employee?" "'You're not. You're the one person that does—that does—oh, you do so much. Tell me, is there a—who uh, are the people who control the club?' Miss Villets emphatically stamped a date in the front of Frank on the Lower Mississippi, for a small flaxen boy, glowered at him as though she were stamping a warning on his brain, and sighed, "'I wouldn't put myself forward or criticize anyone for the world, and Vida is one of my best friends, and such a splendid teacher, and there is no one in town more advanced and interested in all movements. But I must say that, no matter who the president or the committees are, Vida Sherwin seems to be behind them all the time, and though she is always telling me about what she is pleased to call my fine work in the library, I notice that I'm not often called on for papers, though Mrs. Lyman Cass once volunteered and told me that she thought my paper on the cathedrals of England was the most interesting paper we had, the year we took up English and French travel and architecture. But, and of course, Mrs. Maud and Mrs. Warren are very important in the club, as you might expect of the wives of the superintendent of schools and the congregational pastor, and indeed they are both very cultured, but, no, you may regard me as entirely unimportant. I'm sure what I say doesn't matter a bit." "'You're much too modest, and I'm going to tell Vida so, and, uh, I wonder if you can give me just a teeny bit of your time and show me where the magazine files are kept." She had won. She was profusely escorted to a room like a grandmother's attic, where she discovered periodicals devoted to house decoration and town planning, with a six-year file of the National Geographic. Miss Villets blessedly left her alone. Humming, fluttering pages with delighted fingers, Carol sat cross-legged on the floor, the magazines in heaps about her. She found pictures of New England streets, the dignity of Falmouth, the charm of Concord, Stockbridge and Farmington and Hill House Avenue, the fairy book suburb of Forest Hills on Long Island, Devonshire cottages and Essex manors and a Yorkshire high street and port sunlight, the Arab village of Jeddah, an intricately chased jewel box, a town in California which had changed itself from the barren brick fronts and slatternly frame sheds of a main street to a way which led the eye down a vista of arcades and gardens. Assured that she was not quite mad in her belief that a small American town might be lovely, as well as useful in buying wheat and selling plows, she sat brooding, her thin fingers playing a tattoo on her cheeks. She saw in Gopher Prairie a Georgian city hall, warm brick walls with white shutters, a fanlight, a wide hall and curving stair. She saw it the common home and inspiration not only of the town, but of the country about. It should contain the courtroom, she couldn't get herself to put in a jail, public library, a collection of excellent prints, restroom and model kitchen for farm wives, theater, lecture room, free community ballroom, farm bureau, gymnasium. Forming about it and influenced by it, as medieval villages gathered about the castle, she saw a new Georgian town as graceful and beloved as Annapolis or that bowery Alexandria to which Washington rode. All this the Thanatopsis Club was to accomplish with no difficulty whatever, since its several husbands were the controllers of business and politics. 
she was proud of herself for this practical view. She had taken only half an hour to change a wire-fenced potato plot into a walled rose garden. She hurried out to apprise Mrs. Leonard Warren, as president of the Thanatopsis, of the miracle which had been worked. 3. At a quarter to three, Carol had left home. At half-past four, she had created the Georgian town. At a quarter to five, she was in the dignified poverty of the Congregational Parsonage, her enthusiasm pattering upon Mrs. Leonard Warren like summer rain upon an old gray roof. At two minutes to five, a town of demure courtyards and welcoming dormer windows had been erected, and at two minutes past five, the entire town was as flat as Babylon. Erect in a black William and Mary chair, against gray and speckly brown volumes of sermons and biblical commentaries and Palestine geographies upon long pine shelves, her neat black shoes firm on a rag rug, herself as correct and low-toned as her background, Mrs. Warren listened without comment till Carol was quite through, then answered delicately, "'Yes, I think you draw a very nice picture of what might easily come to pass. Some day. I have no doubt that such villages will be found on the prairie. Some day. But if I might make just the least little criticism. It seems to me that you are wrong in supposing either that the city hall would be the proper start, or that the Thanatopsis would be the right instrument. After all, it's the churches, isn't it, that are the real heart of the community? As you may possibly know, my husband is prominent in congregational circles all through the state for his advocacy of church union. He hopes to see all the evangelical denominations join in one strong body, opposing Catholicism and Christian science, and properly guiding all movements that make for morality and prohibition. Here the combined churches could afford a splendid clubhouse, maybe a stucco and half-timber building with gargoyles and all sorts of pleasing decorations on it which, it seems to me, would be lots better to impress the ordinary class of people than just a plain, old-fashioned colonial house such as you describe. And that would be the proper centre for all educational and pleasurable activities, instead of letting them fall into the hands of the politicians. "'I don't suppose it will take more than thirty or forty years for the churches to get together,' Carol said innocently. "'Hardly that long, even. Things are moving so rapidly.' so it would be a mistake to make any other plans." Carol did not recover her zeal till two days after, when she tried Mrs. George Edwin Mott, wife of the superintendent of schools. Mrs. Mott commented, "'Personally, I'm terribly busy with dressmaking and having the seamstress in the house and all, but it would be splendid to have the other members of the Thanatopsis take up the question. Except for one thing. First and foremost, we must have a new school-building. Mr. Mott says they are terribly cramped." Carol went to view the old building. The grades in the high school were combined in a damp yellow-brick structure with the narrow windows of an antiquated jail, a hulk which expressed hatred and compulsory training. She conceded Mrs. Mott's demand so violently that for two days she dropped her own campaign. Then she built the school and city hall together as the center of the reborn town. She ventured to the lead-colored dwelling of Mrs. Dave Dyer. Behind the mask of winter-stripped vines and a wide porch only a foot above the ground, the cottage was so impersonal that Carol could never visualize it. Nor could she remember anything that was inside it. But Mrs. Dyer was personal enough. With Carol, Mrs. Howland, Mrs. McGannum, and Vida Sherwin, she was a link between the Jolly Seventeen and the serious Thanatopsis, in contrast to Juanita Haydock, who unnecessarily boasted of being a lowbrow and publicly stated that she would see herself in jail before she write any darn old club papers. Mrs. Dyer was super-feminine in the kimono in which she received Carol. Her skin was fine, pale, soft, suggesting a weak voluptuousness. At afternoon coffees she had been rude, but now she addressed Carol as dear, and insisted on being called Maud. Carol did not quite know why she was uncomfortable in this talcum-powder atmosphere, but she hastened to get into the fresh air of her plans. Maud Dyer granted that the city hall wasn't so very nice, yet, as Dave said, 
there was no use in doing anything about it till they received an appropriation from the state and combined a new city hall with a National Guard armory. Dave had given verdict. What these mouthy youngsters that hang around the pool room need is universal military training. Make men of them. Mrs. Dyer removed the new school building from the city hall. Oh, so Mrs. Mott has got you going on her school craze. She's been dinging at that till everybody's sick and tired. What she really wants is a big office for her dear bald-headed George to sit around and look important in. Of course, I admire Mrs. Mott, and I'm very fond of her. She's so brainy, even if she does try to bud in and run the Thanatopsis. But I must say we're sick of her nagging. The old building was good enough for us when we were kids. I hate these would-be women politicians, don't you? 4. The first week of March had given promise of spring, and stirred Carol with a thousand desires for lakes and fields and roads. The snow was gone, except for filthy woolly patches under trees. The thermometer leaped in a day from wind-bitten chill to itchy warmth. As soon as Carol was convinced that even in this imprisoned north spring could exist again, the snow came down as abruptly as a paper storm in a theater. The northwest gale flung it up in a half-blizzard, and with her hope of a glorified town went hope of summer meadows. But a week later, though the snow was everywhere in slushy heaps, the promise was unmistakable. By the invisible hints in air and sky and earth which had aroused her every year through ten thousand generations she knew that spring was coming. It was not a scorching, hard, dusty day like the treacherous intruder of a week before, but soaked with languor, softened with a milky light. Rivulets were hurrying in each alley. A calling robin appeared by magic on the crab-apple tree in the Howland's yard. Everybody chuckled. "'Looks like winter is going!' and This'll bring the frost out of the roads. Have the autos out pretty soon now. Wonder what kind of bass fishing we'll get this summer. Ought to be good crops this year." Each evening Kennicott repeated, "'We better not take off our heavy underwear or the storm windows too soon. Might be another spell of cold. Got to be careful about catching cold. Wonder if the coal will last through.' The expanding forces of life within her choked the desire for reforming. She trotted through the house, planning the spring cleaning with B. When she attended her second meeting of the Thanatopsis, she said nothing about remaking the town. She listened respectably to statistics on Dickens, Thackeray, Jane Austen, George Eliot, Scott, Hardy, Lamb, De Quincey, and Mrs. Humphrey Ward, who, it seemed, constituted the writers of English fiction and essays. Not till she inspected the restroom did she again become a fanatic. She had often glanced at the store building which had been turned into a refuge in which farm wives could wait while their husbands transacted business. She had heard Vida Sherwin and Mrs. Warren caress the virtue of the Thanatopsis in establishing the restroom and in sharing with the city council the expense of maintaining it, but she had never entered it till this March day. She went in impulsively, nodded at the matron, a plump worthy widow named Nodalquist and at a couple of farm women who were meekly rocking. The restroom resembled a second-hand store. It was furnished with discarded patent rockers, lopsided reed chairs, a scratched pine table, a gritty straw mat, old steel engravings of milkmaids being morally amorous under willow trees, faded chromos of roses and fish, and a kerosene stove for warming lunches. The front window was darkened by torn net curtains and by a mound of geraniums and rubber plants. While she was listening to Mrs. Nolquist's account of how many thousands of farmers' wives use the restroom every year, and how much they appreciated the kindness of the ladies in providing them with this lovely place and all free, she thought, kindness is nothing. The kind ladies' husbands get the farmers' trade. This is mere commercial accommodation. And it's horrible. It ought to be the most charming room in town, to comfort women sick of prairie kitchens. Certainly it ought to have a clear window, so that they can see the metropolitan life go by. Some day I'm going to make a better restroom, a club room. Why, I've already planned that as part of my Georgian town hall. 
So it chanced that she was plotting against the peace of the Thanatopsis at her third meeting, which covered Scandinavian, Russian, and Polish literature, with remarks by Mrs. Leonard Warren on the sinful paganism of the Russian so-called church. Even before the entrance of the coffee and hot rolls, Carol seized on Mrs. Champ Perry, the kind and ample-bosomed pioneer woman who gave historic dignity to the modern matrons of the Thanatopsis. She poured out her plans. Mrs. Perry nodded and stroked Carol's hand, but at the end she sighed. "'I wish I could agree with you, dearie. I'm sure you're one of the Lord's anointed, even if we don't see you at the Baptist Church as often as we'd like to. But I'm afraid you're too tender-hearted. When Champ and I came here we teamed it with an ox-cart from Sauk Center to Gopher Prairie, and there was nothing here then but a stockade and a few soldiers and some log cabins. When we wanted salt pork and gunpowder we sent out a man on horseback, and probably he was shot dead by the Indians before he got back. We ladies, of course we were all farmers at first, we didn't expect any rest-room in those days. My, we'd have thought the one they have now was simply elegant. My house was roofed with hay, and it leaked something terrible when it rained. Only dry place was under a shelf. And when the town grew up we thought the new city hall was real fine. And I don't see any need for dance halls. Dancing isn't what it was, anyway. We used to dance modest, and we had just as much fun as all these young folks do now with their terrible turkey trots and hugging and all. But if they must neglect the Lord's injunction that young girls ought to be modest, then I guess they manage pretty well at the K.P. Hall and the Odd Fellows, even if some of the lodges don't always welcome a lot of these foreigners and hired help to all their dances. And I certainly don't see any need of a farm bureau or this domestic science demonstration you talk about. In my day the boys learned to farm by honest sweating, and every gal could cook, or her ma learned her how across her knee. Besides, ain't there a county agent at Wakeman? He comes here once a fortnight, maybe. That's enough monkeying around with this scientific farming. Champ says there's nothing to it anyway. And as for a lecture hall, haven't we got the churches? Good deal better to listen to a good old-fashioned sermon than a lot of geography and books and things that nobody needs to know. More than enough heathen learning right here in the Thanatopsis. And as for trying to make a whole town in this colonial architecture you talk about, I do love nice things. To this day I run ribbons into my petticoats, even if Champ Perry does laugh at me, the old villain. But, just the same, I don't believe any of us old-timers would like to see the town that we work so hard to build being torn down to make a place that wouldn't look like nothing but some Dutch storybook and not a bit like the place we loved. And don't you think it's sweet now? All the trees and lawns and such comfy houses, and hot-water heat, and electric lights, and telephones, and cement walks, and everything. Why, I thought everybody from the Twin Cities always said it was such a beautiful town." Carol forswore herself, declared that Gopher Prairie had the color of Algiers and the gaiety of Mardi Gras. Yet the next afternoon she was pouncing on Mrs. Lyman Cass, the hook-nosed consort of the owner of the flour mill. Mrs. Cass's parlor belonged to the crammed Victorian school, as Mrs. Luke Dawson belonged to the bare Victorian. It was furnished on two principles. First, everything must resemble something else. A rocker had a back like a lyre, a near-leather seat imitating tufted cloth, and arms like Scotch Presbyterian lions, with knobs, scrolls, shields, and spear-points on unexpected portions of the chair. The second principle of the crammed Victorian school was that every inch of the interior must be filled with useless objects. The walls of Mrs. Cass's parlor were plastered with hand-painted pictures, buckeye pictures of birch trees, newsboys, puppies, and church steeples on Christmas Eve, with a plaque depicting the exposition building in Minneapolis, burnt wood portraits of Indian chiefs of no tribe in particular, a dansy-decked poetic motto, a yard of roses, and the banners of the educational institutions attended by the Cass's two sons, Chicopee Falls Business College and McGillicuddy University. One small square table contained a card receiver of painted china, with a rim of wrought and gilded lead, a family Bible, Grant's memoirs, the latest novel by Mrs. Jean Stratton Porter, 
a wooden model of a Swiss chalet which was also a bank for dimes, a polished abalone shell holding one black-headed pin and one empty spool, a velvet pincushion in a gilded metal slipper with Souvenir of Troy N.Y. stamped on the toe, and an unexplained red glass dish which had warts. Mrs. Cass's first remark was, "'I must show you all my pretty things and art objects.' She piped after Carol's appeal. "'I see. You think the New England villages and colonial houses are so much more cunning than these Middle Western towns. I'm glad you feel that way. You'll be interested to know I was born in Vermont.' "'And don't you think we ought to try to make gopher pre—' "'My gracious, no! We can't afford it! Taxes are much too high as it is. We ought to retrench and not let the city council spend another cent. Ah, uh, don't you think there was a grand paper Mrs. Westlake read about Tolstoy? I was so glad she pointed out how all his silly socialistic ideas failed. What Mrs. Cass said was what Kennicott said that evening. Not in twenty years would the council propose or go for prairie vote the funds for a new city hall. 5. Carol had avoided exposing her plans to Vida Sherwin. She was shy of the big sister manner. Vida would either laugh at her or snatch the idea and change it to suit herself. But there was no other hope. When Vida came in to tea, Carol sketched her utopia. Vida was soothing but decisive. "'My dear, you're all off. I would like to see it, a real gardeny place to shut out the gales, but it can't be done. What could the club women accomplish? Their husbands are the most important men in town. They are the town. But the town as a separate unit is not the husband of the Thanatopsis. If you knew the trouble we had in getting the city council to spend the money and cover the pumping station with vines, whatever you may think of Gopher Prairie women, they're twice as progressive as the men. But can't the men see the ugliness? They don't think it's ugly, and how can you prove it? Matter of taste. Why should they like what a Boston architect likes? What they like is to sell prunes. Well, why not? Anyway, the point is that you have to work from the inside, with what we have, rather than from the outside, with foreign ideas. The shell ought not to be forced on the spirit. It can't be. The bright shell has to grow out of the spirit and express it. That means waiting. If we keep after the city council for another ten years, they may vote the bonds for a new school. I refuse to believe that if they saw it, the big men would be too tight-fisted to spend a few dollars each for a building. Think, dancing and lectures and plays, all done cooperatively. You mention the word cooperative to the merchants and they'll lynch you. The one thing they fear more than mail-order houses is that farmers' cooperative movements may get started. The secret trails that lead to scared pocketbooks. Always in everything. And I don't have any of the fine melodrama of fiction, the dictographs and speeches by torchlight. I'm merely blocked by stupidity. Oh, I know I'm a fool. I dream of Venice, and I live in Archangel, and scold because the northern seas aren't tender-colored. But at least they shan't keep me from loving Venice, and sometime I'll run away. All right, no more." She flung out her hands in a gesture of renunciation. 6. Early May. Wheat springing up in blades like grass, corn and potatoes being planted, the land humming. For two days there had been steady rain. Even in town the roads were a furrowed welter of mud, hideous to view and difficult to cross. Main Street was a black swamp from curb to curb. On resident streets the grass parking beside the walks oozed gray water. It was prickly hot, yet the town was barren under the bleak sky. Softened neither by snow nor by waving boughs, the houses squatted and scowled, revealed in their unkempt harshness. As she dragged homeward, Carol looked with distaste at her clay-loaded rubbers, the smeared hem of her skirt. She passed Lyman Cass's pinnacled, dark-red, hulking house. She waded a streaky yellow pool. This morass was not her home, she insisted. 
Her home and her beautiful town existed in her mind. They had already been created. The task was done. What she really had been questing was someone to share them with her. Vida would not, Kennicott could not. Someone to share her refuge. Suddenly she was thinking of Guy Pollock. She dismissed him. He was too cautious. She needed a spirit as young and unreasonable as her own. And she would never find it. Youth would never come singing. She was beaten. Yet that same evening she had an idea which solved the rebuilding of Gopher Prairie. Within ten minutes she was jerking the old-fashioned bell-pull of Luke Dawson. Mrs. Dawson opened the door and peered doubtfully about the edge of it. Carol kissed her cheek and frisked into the lugubrious sitting-room. "'Well, well, you're a sight for sore eyes,' chuckled Mr. Dawson, dropping his newspaper, pushing his spectacles back on his forehead. "'You seem so excited,' sighed Mrs. Dawson. "'I am. Mr. Dawson, aren't you a millionaire?' He cocked his head and purred, "'Well, I guess if I cashed in on all my securities and farm holdings, on my interest in iron on the Maseba, and in northern timber and cutover lands, I could push two million dollars pretty close, and I've made every cent of it by hard work and having the sense not to go out and spend every—I think I want most of it from you.' The Dawsons glanced at each other in appreciation of the jest, and he chirped, "'You're worse than Reverend Benlick. He didn't hardly ever strike me for more than ten dollars, at a time." "'I'm not joking. I mean it. Your children in the cities are grown up and well-to-do. You don't want to die and leave your name unknown. Why not do a big, original thing? Why not rebuild the whole town? Get a great architect and have him plan a town that would be suitable to the prairie. Perhaps he'd create some entirely new form of architecture, then tear down all these shambling buildings. Mr. Dawson had decided that she really did mean it. He wailed, "'Why, that would cost at least three or four million dollars. But you alone, just one man, have two of those millions. Me? Spend all my hard-earned cash on building houses for a lot of shiftless beggars that never had the sense to save their money? Not that I have ever been mean. Mama could always have a hired girl to do the work, when we could find one. But her and I have worked our fingers to the bone, and spend it on a lot of these rascals? Please, don't be angry. I just mean, I mean, oh, not spend all of it, of course, but if you let off the list and others came in, and if they heard you talk about a more attractive town. Why now, child, you've got a lot of notions. Besides, what's the matter with the town? Looks good to me. I've had people that have traveled all over the world tell me time and again that Gopher Prairie is the prettiest place in the Middle West. Good enough for anybody. Certainly good enough for Mama and me. Besides, Mama and me are planning to go out to Pasadena and buy a bungalow and live there." 7. She had met Miles Bjornstam on the street. For the second of welcome encounter, this workman with the bandit mustache and the muddy overalls seemed nearer than anyone else to the credulous youth which she was seeking to fight beside her, and she told him, as a cheerful anecdote, a little of her story. He grunted, "'I never thought I'd be agreeing with old man Dawson, the penny-pinching old land-thief, and a fine bribery is, too. But you got the wrong slant. You aren't one of the people, yet. You want to do something for the town. I don't. I want the town to do something for itself. We don't want old Dawson's money. Not if it's a gift with a string. We'll take it away from him, because it belongs to us. You got to get more iron and cussedness into you. Come join us cheerful bums, and some day, when we educate ourselves and quit being bums, we'll take things and run them straight." He had changed from her friend to a cynical man in overalls. She could not relish the autocracy of cheerful bums. She forgot him as she tramped the outskirts of town. She had replaced the City Hall project by an entirely new and highly exhilarating thought of how little was done for these unpicturesque poor. 8. The spring of the plains is not a reluctant virgin, but brazen and soon away. The mud roads of a few days ago are powdery dust and the puddles beside them have hardened into lozenges of black sleek earth, like cracked patent leather. 
Carol was panting as she crept to the meeting of the Thanatopsis Program Committee, which was to decide the subject for next fall and winter. Madam Chairman, Miss Ella Stobody in an oyster-colored blouse, asked if there was any new business. Carol rose. She suggested that the Thanatopsis ought to help the poor of the town. She was ever so correct and modern. She did not, she said, want charity for them, but a chance of self-help. An employment bureau, direction in washing babies and making pleasing stews, possibly a municipal fund for home-building. "'What do you think of my plans, Mrs. Warren?' she concluded. Speaking judiciously, as one related to the church by marriage, Mrs. Warren gave verdict. "'I'm sure we're all heartily in accord with Mrs. Kennicott in feeling that wherever genuine poverty is encountered, it is not only noblesse oblige, but a joy to fulfill our duty to the less fortunate ones. But, I must say, it seems to me we should lose the whole point of the thing by not regarding it as charity. Why, that's the chief adornment of the true Christian and the Church. The Bible has laid it down for our guidance. Faith, hope, and charity, it says, and the poor ye have with ye always, which indicates that there never can be anything to these so-called scientific schemes for abolishing charity, never. And isn't it better so? I should hate to think of a world in which we were deprived of all the pleasure of giving. Besides, if these shiftless folks realize they're getting charity, and not something to which they have a right, they're so much more grateful." "'Besides,' snorted Miss Ellis Stobody, "'they've been fooling you, Miss Kennicott. There isn't any real poverty here. Take that Mrs. Steinhoff you speak of. I send her our washing whenever there's too much for our hired girl. I must have sent her ten dollars' worth the past year alone. I'm sure Papa would never approve of a city home-building fund. Papa says these folks are fakers, especially all these tenant farmers that pretend they have so much trouble getting seed and machinery. Papa says they simply won't pay their debts. He says he's sure he hates to foreclose mortgages, but it's the only way to make them respect the law." "'And then think of all the clothes we give these people.' said Mrs. Jackson Elder. Carol intruded again. Oh, yes, the clothes. I was going to speak of that. Don't you think that when we give clothes to the poor, if we do give them old ones, we ought to mend them first and make them as presentable as we can? Next Christmas, when the Thanatopsis makes its distribution, wouldn't it be jolly if we got together and sewed on the clothes and trimmed hats and made them— Heavens and earth! They have more time than we have! They ought to be mighty good and grateful to get anything, no matter what shape it's in. I know I'm not going to sit and sew for that lazy Mrs. Vopney with all I've got to do," snapped Ella Stobody. They were glaring at Carol. She reflected that Mrs. Vopney, whose husband had been killed by a train, had ten children. But Mrs. Mary Ellen Wilkes was smiling. Mrs. Wilkes was the proprietor of Ye Art Shop and Magazine and Bookstore, and the reader of the small Christian Science Church. She made it all clear. If this class of people had an understanding of science, and that we are the children of God and nothing can harm us, they wouldn't be in error and poverty. Mrs. Jackson Elder confirmed. Besides, it strikes me the club is already doing enough, with tree planting and the anti fly campaign and the responsibility for the restroom to say nothing of the fact that we've talked of trying to get the railroad to put in a park at the station." "'I think so, too,' said Madam Chairman. She glanced uneasily at Miss Sherwin. "'But what do you think, Vida?' Vida smiled tactfully at each of the committee and announced, "'Well, I don't believe we'd better start anything more right now, but it's been a privilege to hear Carol's dear generous ideas, hasn't it? Oh, there's one thing we must decide on at once. We must get together and oppose any move on the part of the Minneapolis clubs to elect another state federation president from the Twin Cities. And this Mrs. Edgar Potberry they're putting forward. I know there are people who think she's a bright, interesting speaker, but I regard her as very shallow. What do you say to my writing to the Lake Ojibawasha Club, telling them that if their district will support Mrs. Warren for second vice president, we'll support their Mrs. Hagleton? and such a dear, lovely, cultivated woman, too, for president. "'Yes, we ought to show up these Minneapolis folks,' Ella Stobody said acidly. "'And, oh, by the way, 
we must oppose this movement of Mrs. Potberry's to have the state clubs come out definitely in favor of women's suffrage. Women haven't any place in politics. They would lose all their daintiness and charm if they became involved in these horrid plots and log-rolling and all this awful political stuff about scandal and personalities and so on." All save one nodded. They interrupted the formal business meeting to discuss Mrs. Edgar Potberry's husband, Mrs. Potberry's income, Mrs. Potberry's sedan, Mrs. Potberry's residence, Mrs. Potberry's oratorical style, Mrs. Potberry's Mandarin evening coat, Mrs. Potberry's coiffure, and Mrs. Potberry's altogether reprehensible influence on the State Federation of Women's Clubs. Before the program committee adjourned, they took three minutes to decide which of the subjects suggested by the magazine Culture Hints, Furnishings in China, or the Bible as Literature, would be better for the coming year. There was one annoying incident. Mrs. Dr. Kennicott interfered and showed off again. She commented, don't you think that we already get enough of the Bible in our churches and Sunday schools?" Mrs. Leonard Warren, somewhat out of order but much more out of temper, cried, "'Well, upon my word! I didn't suppose there was anyone who felt that we could get enough of the Bible. I guess if the grand old book has withstood the attacks of infidels for these two thousand years, it is worth our slight consideration.' "'Oh, I didn't mean—' Carol begged inasmuch as she did mean, it was hard to be extremely lucid. But I wish, instead of limiting ourselves either to the Bible or to anecdotes about the brothers Adam's wigs, which culture hints seems to regard as the significant point about furniture, we could study some of the really stirring ideas that are springing up today, whether it's chemistry or anthropology or labor problems, the things that are going to mean so terribly much." Everybody cleared their polite throat. Madam Chairman inquired, "'Is there any other discussion?' "'Will someone make a motion to adopt the suggestion of Maida Sherwin to take up furnishings in China?' It was adopted unanimously. "'Checkmate,' murmured Carol, as she held up her hand. Had she actually believed that she could plant a seed of liberalism in the blank wall of mediocrity? How had she fallen into the folly of trying to plant anything whatever in a wall so smooth and sun-glazed, and so satisfying to the happy sleepers within? End of chapter 11《Chapter 12 of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 1 one week of authentic spring, one rare sweet week of May, one tranquil moment between the blast of winter and the charge of summer. Daily, Carol walked from town into flashing country hysteric with new life. One enchanted hour when she returned to youth and a belief in the possibility of beauty. She had walked northward toward the upper shore of Plover Lake, taking to the railroad track whose directness and dryness make it the natural highway for pedestrians on the plains. She stepped from tie to tie in long strides. At each road crossing she had to crawl over a cattle guard of sharpened timbers. She walked the rails, balancing with arms extended, cautious heel before toe. As she lost balance her body bent over, her arms revolved wildly, and when she toppled she laughed aloud. The thick grass beside the track, coarse and prickly with many burnings, had canary-yellow buttercups and the mauve petals and woolly sage-green coats of the pasque flowers. The branches of the kinnikinnick brush were red and smooth as lacquer on a sacky bowl. She ran down the gravelly embankment, smiled at children gathering flowers in a little basket, thrust a handful of the soft pasque flowers into the bosom of her white blouse. Fields of springing wheat drew her from the straight propriety of the railroad, and she crawled through the rusty barbed wire fence. She followed a furrow between low wheat blades and a field of rye, which showed silver lights as it flowed before the wind. She found a pasture by the lake. So sprinkled was the pasture with ragbaby blossoms and the cottony herb of Indian tobacco that it spread out like a rare old Persian carpet of cream and rose and delicate green. Under her feet the rough grass made a pleasant crunching. 
Sweet winds blew from the sunny lake beside her, and small waves sputtered on the meadowy shore. She leaped a tiny creek bowered in pussy-willow buds. She was nearing a frivolous grove of birch and poplar and wild plum-trees. The poplar foliage had the downiness of a corot arbor. The green and silver trunks were as candid as the birches, as slender and lustrous as the limbs of a perot. The cloudy white blossoms of the plum-trees filled the grove with a springtime mistiness which gave an illusion of distance. She ran into the wood, crying out for joy of freedom regained after winter. Choke-cherry blossoms lured her from the outer sun-warmed spaces to depths of green stillness, where a submarine light came through the young leaves. She walked pensively along an abandoned road. She found a moccasin flower beside a lichen-covered log. At the end of the road she saw the open acres, dipping rolling fields bright with wheat. I believe the woodland gods still live, and out there the great land. It's beautiful as the mountains. What do I care for Thanatopsises? She came out on the prairie, spacious under an arch of boldly cut clouds. Small pools glittered. Above a marsh red-winged blackbirds chased a crow in a swift melodrama of the air. On a hill was silhouetted a man following a drag. His horse bent its neck and plodded, content. A path took her to the Corinth road, leading back to town. Dandelions glowed in patches amidst the wild grass by the way. A stream galloped through a concrete culvert beneath the road. She trudged in healthy weariness. A man in a bumping Ford rattled up beside her, hailed, "'Give you a lift, Mrs. Kennicott?' "'Thank you. It's awfully good of you, but I'm enjoying the walk.' "'Great day, by golly! I seen some wheat that must have been five inches high. Well, so long!' She had the dimmest notion who he was, but his greeting warmed her. This countryman gave her a companionship which she had never had whether by her fault or theirs or neither, been able to find in the matrons and commercial lords of the town. Half a mile from town, in a hollow between hazelnut bushes and a brook, she discovered a gypsy encampment, a covered wagon, a tent, a bunch of pegged-out horses. A broad-shouldered man was squatted on his heels, holding a frying-pan over a campfire. He looked toward her. He was Miles Bjornstam. "'Well, well, what you doing out here?' he roared. "'Come, have a hunk of bacon. Pete! Hey, Pete!' A tousled person came from behind the covered wagon. "'Pete, here's the one honest-to-God lady in my bum town. Come on, crawl in, and set a couple minutes, Mrs. Kennicott. I'm hiking off for all summer.' The Red Swede staggered up, rubbed his cramped knees, lumbered to the wire fence, held the strands apart for her. She unconsciously smiled at him as she went through. Her skirt caught on a barb, he carefully freed it. Beside this man in blue flannel shirt, baggy khaki trousers, uneven suspenders and vile felt hat, she was small and exquisite. The surly Pete set out an upturned bucket for her. She lounged on it, her elbows on her knees. "'Where are you going?' she asked. "'Just starting off for the summer, horse trading. Bjornstam chuckled. His red mustache caught the sun. "'Regular hobos and public benefactors we are. Take a hike like this every once in a while. Sharks on horses. Buy them from farmers and sell them to others. We're honest. Frequently. Great time. Camp along the road. I was wishing I had a chance to say good-bye to you before I ducked out, but... Say, you better come along with us. I'd like to. While you're playing mumbledy peg with Mrs. Lime Cass, Pete and me will be rambling across Dakota, through the Badlands, into the Butte country, and when fall comes, we'll be crossing over a pass of the Bighorn Mountains, maybe, and camp in a snowstorm, quarter of a mile right straight up above a lake. Then in the morning we'll lie snug in our blankets and look up through the pines at an eagle. How'd it strike you, hey? Eagle soaring and soaring all day, big wide sky. Don't, or I will go with you, and I'm afraid there might be some slight scandal. Perhaps some day I'll do it. Good-bye." Her hand disappeared in his blackened leather glove. From the turn in the road she waved at him. 
She walked on more soberly now, and she was lonely. But the weed and grass were sleek velvet under the sunset, the prairie clouds were tawny gold, and she swung happily into Main Street. 2. Through the first days of June she drove with Kennicott on his calls. She identified him with the virile land. She admired him as she saw with what respect the farmers obeyed him. She was out in the early chill, after a hasty cup of coffee, reaching open country as the fresh sun came up in that unspoiled world. Meadowlarks called from the tops of thin split fence-posts. The wild roses smelled clean. As they returned in late afternoon, the low sun was a solemnity of radial bands, like a heavenly fan of beaten gold. The limitless circle of the grain was a green sea rimmed with fog, and the willow windbreaks were palmy isles. Before July the close heat blanketed them. The tortured earth cracked. Farmers panted through cornfields behind cultivators and the sweating flanks of horses. While she waited for Kennicott in the car, before a farmhouse, the seat burned her fingers and her head ached with a glare on fenders and hood. A black thunder-shower was followed by a dust-storm which turned the sky yellow with the hint of a coming tornado. Impalpable black dust far borne from Dakota covered the inner sills of the closed windows. The July heat was ever more stifling. They crawled along Main Street by day, they found it hard to sleep at night. They brought mattresses down to the living room and thrashed and turned by the open window. Ten times a night they talked of going out to soak themselves with the hose and wade through the dew, but they were too listless to take the trouble. On cool evenings, when they tried to go walking, the gnats appeared in swarms which peppered their faces and caught in their throats. She wanted the northern pines, the eastern sea, but Kennicott declared that it would be kind of hard to get away just now. The Health and Improvement Committee of the Thanatopsis asked her to take part in the anti-fly campaign, and she toiled about town persuading householders to use the fly traps furnished by the club, or giving out money prizes to fly-swatting children. She was loyal enough but not ardent, and without ever quite intending to she began to neglect the task as heat sucked at her strength. Kennicott and she motored north and spent a week with his mother that is, Carol spent it with his mother, while he fished for bass. The great event was their purchase of a summer cottage, down on Lake Minimashi. Perhaps the most amiable feature of life in Gopher Prairie was the summer cottages. They were merely two-room shanties, with seepage of broken-down chairs, peeling veneered tables, chromos pasted on wooden walls, and inefficient kerosene stoves. They were so thin-walled and so close together that you could, and did, hear a baby being spanked in the fifth cottage off. But they were set among elms and lindens on a bluff which looked across the lake to fields of ripened wheat sloping up to green woods. Here the matrons forgot social jealousies, and sat gossiping in gingham or in old bathing suits surrounded by hysterical children, they paddled for hours. Carol joined them. She ducked shrieking small boys and helped babies construct sand-basins for unfortunate minnows. She liked Juanita Haydock and Maud Dyer when she helped them make picnic supper for the men who came motoring out from town each evening. She was easier and more natural with them. In the debate as to whether there should be veal loaf or poached egg on hash she had no chance to be heretical and oversensitive. They danced sometimes, in the evening. They had a minstrel show with Kennicott surprisingly good as end-man. Always they were encircled by children wise in the lore of woodchucks and gophers and rafts and willow-whistles. If they could have continued this normal barbaric life, Carol would have been the most enthusiastic citizen of Gopher Prairie. She was relieved to be assured that she did not want bookish conversation alone, that she did not expect the town to become a bohemia. She was content now. She did not criticize. But in September, when the year was at its richest, custom dictated that it was time to return to town, to remove the children from the waste occupation of learning the earth and send them back to lessons about the number of potatoes which, in a delightful world untroubled by commission houses or shortages in freight cars, William sold to John. 
The women who had cheerfully gone bathing all summer looked doubtful when Carol begged, "'Let's keep up an outdoor life this winter. Let's slide and skate.' Their hearts shut again till spring, and the nine months of clicks and radiators and dainty refreshments began all over. 3. Carol had started a salon. Since Kennicott, Vida Sherwin, and Guy Pollock were her only lions, and since Kennicott would have preferred Sam Clark to all the poets and radicals in the entire world, her private and self-defensive clique did not get beyond one evening dinner for Vida and Guy on her first wedding anniversary. And that dinner did not get beyond a controversy regarding Ramy Weatherspoon's yearnings. Guy Pollock was the gentlest person she had found here. He spoke of her new jade and cream frock naturally, not jocosely. He held her chair for her as they sat down to dinner, and he did not, like Kennicott, interrupt her to shout, Oh, say, speaking of that, I heard a good story today. But Guy was incurably hermit. He sat late and talked hard and did not come again. Then she met Champ Perry in the post office and decided that in the history of the pioneers was the panacea for Gopher Prairie, for all of America. We have lost their sturdiness, she told herself. We must restore the last of the veterans to power, and follow them on the backward path to the integrity of Lincoln, to the gaiety of settlers dancing in a sawmill. She read in the records of the Minnesota Territorial Pioneers that only sixty years ago, not so far back as the birth of her own father, Four cabins had composed Gopher Prairie. The log stockade which Mrs. Champ Perry was to find when she trekked in was built afterward by the soldiers as a defense against the Sioux. The four cabins were inhabited by Maine Yankees who had come up the Mississippi to St. Paul and driven north over Virgin Prairie into Virgin Woods. They ground their own corn. The men folk shot ducks and pigeons and prairie chickens. The new breakings yielded the turnip-like rutabagas which they ate raw and boiled and baked and raw again. For treat they had wild plums and crab-apples and tiny wild strawberries. Grasshoppers came darkening the sky, and in an hour ate the farm-wife's garden and the farmer's coat. Precious horses painfully brought from Illinois were drowned in bogs or stampeded by the fear of blizzards. Snow blew through the chinks of new-made cabins and eastern children, with flowery muslin dresses, shivered all winter, and in summer were red and black with mosquito bites. Indians were everywhere. They camped in dooryards, stalked into kitchens to demand doughnuts, came with rifles across their backs into schoolhouses and begged to see the pictures in the geographies. Packs of timber wolves treed the children, and the settlers found dens of rattlesnakes, killed fifty, a hundred in a day. Yet it was a buoyant life. Carol read enviously in the admirable Minnesota chronicles called Old Rail Fence Corners the reminiscence of Mrs. Mullen Black, who settled in Stillwater in 1848. There was nothing to parade over in those days. We took it as it came and had happy lives. We would all gather together and in about two minutes we'd be having a good time, playing cards or dancing. We used to waltz and dance contra dances none of these new jigs and not wearing any clothes to speak of. We covered our hides in those days, no tight skirts like now. You could take three or four steps inside our skirts and then not reach the edge. One of the boys would fiddle a while and then someone would spell him and we could get a dance. Sometimes they would dance and fiddle too. She reflected that if she could not have ballrooms of gray and rose and crystal, she wanted to be swinging across a puncheon floor with a dancing fiddler. This smug in-between town, which had exchanged money musk for phonographs grinding out ragtime, it was neither the heroic old nor the sophisticated new. Couldn't she somehow, some yet unimagined how, turn it back to simplicity? She herself knew two of the pioneers, the Perrys. Champ Perry was the buyer at the grain elevator. He weighed wagons of wheat on a rough platform scale, in the cracks of which the kernel sprouted every spring. Between times he napped in the dusty piece of his office. She called on the Perrys at their rooms above Howland and Gould's grocery. When they were already old they had lost the money which they had invested in an elevator. 
they had given up their beloved yellow brick house and moved into these rooms over a store, which were the Gopher Prairie equivalent of a flat. A broad stairway led from the street to the upper hall, along which were the doors of a lawyer's office, a dentist's, a photographer's studio, the lodge rooms of the affiliated order of Spartans, and, at the back, the Perry's apartment. They received her, their first caller in a month, with aged fluttering tenderness. Mrs. Perry confided, "'My, it's a shame we got to entertain you in such a cramped place, and there ain't any water except that old iron sink outside in the hall, but still, as I say to Champ, beggars can't be choosers. Sides, the brick house was too big for me to sweep, and it was way out, and it's nice to be living down here among folks. Yes, we're glad to be here. But some day maybe we can have a house of our own again. We're saving up. Oh, dear, if we could have our own home! But these rooms are real nice, ain't they?" As old people will, the world over, they had moved as much as possible of their familiar furniture into this small space. Carol had none of the superiority she felt toward Mrs. Lyman Cass's plutocratic parlor. She was at home here. She noted with tenderness all the makeshifts, the darned chair-arms, the patent rocker covered with sleazy cretonne the pasted strips of paper mending the birch-bark napkin rings labeled Papa and Mama. She hinted of her new enthusiasm. To find one of these young folks who took them seriously heartened the Perrys, and she easily drew from them the principles by which Gopher Prairie should be born again, should again become amusing to live in. This was their philosophy complete, in the era of aeroplanes and syndicalism. The Baptist Church, and somewhat less, the Methodist, Congregational, and Presbyterian churches, is the perfect, the divinely ordained standard in music, oratory, philanthropy, and ethics. We don't need all this new-fangled science or this terrible higher criticism that's ruining our young men in colleges. What we need is to get back to the true Word of God, and a good sound belief in hell, like we used to have it preached to us. The Republican Party, the grand old party of Blaine and McKinley, is the agent of the Lord and of the Baptist Church in temporal affairs. All socialists ought to be hanged. Harold Bell Wright is a lovely writer, and he teaches such good morals in his novels, and folks say he's made pret near a million dollars out of them. People who make more than ten thousand a year or less than eight hundred are wicked. Europeans are still wickeder. It doesn't hurt any to drink a glass of beer on a warm day, but anybody who touches wine is headed straight for hell. Virgins are not so virginal as they used to be. Nobody needs drugstore ice cream. Pie is good enough for anybody. The farms want too much for their wheat. The owners of the elevator company expect too much for the salaries they pay. There would be no more trouble or discontent in the world if everybody worked as hard as Pa did when he cleared our first farm. 4. Carol's hero-worship dwindled to polite nodding, and the nodding dwindled to a desire to escape, and she went home with a headache. Next day she saw Miles Bjornstam on the street. "'Just back from Montana. Great summer. Pumped my lungs chuck full of Rocky Mountain air. Now for another world at sassing the bosses of Gopher Prairie!" She smiled at him, and the Perrys faded, the Pioneers faded, till they were but daguerreotypes in a black walnut cupboard. End of chapter 12